Hey everyone, welcome back to the NPT Podcast. This is Will Crane, your host. Thank you so much for joining me as we go through the content you need in order to dominate on test day. So today I've got a practice question for you related to the gastrointestinal system. As you know, as we go through this podcast, we go through the FSBPT's content outline. So this is what the Federation of State Boards of Physical Therapy has outlined as what is necessary entry-level knowledge for PTs entering the practice in the United States. It is the same for all jurisdictions in the US. And so this, the FSBPT content outline, represents the questions that will that you will encounter on test day. So in this case, we're talking about the gastrointestinal system. There's somewhere between three and six questions total. So really, it's not a large system on the exam, but you can expect a couple of questions in all of the categories gastrointestinal examination, differential diagnosis, and interventions. And today we've got a differential diagnosis question for you related to the gastrointestinal system. But before we get to that, just a quick thank you. Thank you for what you do. I know that if that uh, as you were preparing for this, the biggest exam of your life, that it's a lot of work, there's a lot of effort going into this. Likely you are on your way to your clinical right now, maybe you're exercising, whatever it is you're doing, thank you. Thank you for the efforts you put into this. Thank you for coming along with us for the ride at PT Final Exam. And thank you for just being a good clinician. I know that it takes a lot of work to do so and that you and your family will be blessed for for really your entire life as you strive to help not only your patients, but also help to to uh, help to support you and your family. It's just it's just a noble profession. And I know I know that you will experience that deep satisfaction and joy as you participate in it. So as we get through the question, or as we get to the question today, I just want to do a quick reminder. Go over to ptfinalexam.com slash podcast if you're looking for our freebies. We've got a couple of freebies. Plus, I'll talk a little bit more about the, at the end, we'll talk a little bit more about our on-site uh, free, free, it's not, a, it's, I guess it is on a campus, it's not on a university campus, but it's at a campus venue in Chicago where you can attend for free. You get free access to our premium content features. Again, you have to apply to, to to attend that. And to do so, you have to go to ptfinalexam.com slash podcast. That's the easiest way to find that application to attend there. All right, so let's go ahead and dive into our question here for today. Then we'll talk at the end about some of the, the course offerings we've got coming up for the April and July administrations. As I'm recording this, it is actually on test day in January. So I know that a lot of you who are listening to this are targeting down the road. I want to be as much help as I can along that pathway. So without further ado, let's go and dive into our practice question for today. As per our usual, I will read to you the question, give you a moment to respond, and then we will talk about it together. Okay, here we go. While palpating deeply in the left lower abdominal quadrant of a patient, pain is elicited in the patient's right lower quadrant. Which of the following diagnoses is most likely present? So while palpating deeply in the left lower abdominal quadrant of a patient, pain is elicited in the patient's right lower quadrant. Which of the following diagnoses is most likely present? One, appendicitis. Two, cholecystitis. Three, diverticulitis. And four, pancreatitis. So again, the options are appendicitis, cholecystitis, diverticulitis, and pancreatitis. And this is while palpating deeply in the left lower abdominal quadrant of a patient, pain is elicited in the patient's right lower quadrant. Which of the following diagnoses is most likely present? So this question asking you differential diagnosis related to the gastrointestinal system. This is what's called Rov Singh's sign, or Rov Singh's sign, however you want to pronounce it. It is where you palpate in the right, or sorry, you palpate in the left lower quadrant, left lower quadrant, and elicit pain in the right lower quadrant. This is indicative or suggestive of some type of acute appendicitis or certainly peritonitis associated with appendicitis. So what's happening is that as you palpate on the opposite side, on the left lower quadrant, and elicit pain on the right lower quadrant, what you're doing is you're reproducing or you're producing tension in the peritoneal lining. And by placing that tension in the peritoneal lining, you are reproducing pain in the right lower quadrant. This is what's called Rav Singh's sign, or Rav Singh's sign. And this is basically, again, the definition of it is palpation in left lower quadrant with pain reproduction in the right lower quadrant. So I guess it's a little bit like the crossed straight leg raise sign in when we talk about uh, disc pathology in the lumbar spine, that if you, 
basically as you lift one leg and you reproduce pain on the other side, it's indicative of neural issues. Specifically, we're talking about uh, some type of impingement syndrome associated with uh, disc herniation. This is kind of a similar concept with Ravsing sign is that if you're palpating in the left lower quadrant, it will elicit pain in the right lower quadrant because of the inflamed peritoneal lining. So your peritoneal cavity is in trouble because of the appendicitis and you are reproducing that pain by palpating in the left lower quadrant. Now these other incorrect answer options, whenever I think gastrointestinal, it always helps to draw a diagram of the quadrants. So in the right lower quadrant, that's typically where we expect to see symptoms related to the appendix. And so let's say you had no idea what Ravsing sign was and this palpation of the left with irritation on the right. You could at the very least say, all right, the pain is in the right lower quadrant. What is most likely to be the problem in the right lower quadrant? So as I was writing this question for you all, I was, I was thinking to myself, if I just, if I straight up just say, what is Ravsing sign? If you're like me, you'd probably say, I have no idea. I've never heard of Ravsing sign. What's interesting to me is that it's actually specific. It's one of the few tests specifically mentioned on the FSBPT's publicly available content outline. And so it is, you know, it's, it's listed as, for example, the gastrointestinal system could include things like McBurney's point, a Rob Singh sign, uh, what is it, fecal impaction, questionnaires, uh, things of that nature. But it's interesting, again, Rob Singh sign is included on that list. Point is that if you knew nothing else about the name Rob Singh sign or what's going on, you should at least be able to confirm in your mind that the appendix is typically in the right lower quadrant. I say typically because it is possible and there are, are certain demographics where you get the flipped viscera where it's a mirror image, right versus left. But typically speaking, and especially for test day, you would expect that right lower quadrant pain would be associated with appendicitis. These other incorrect answer options, cholecystitis, this is also known as gallstones, cholecystitis or these gallstones, it's most likely to be, uh, to be, to have the pain elicited with palpation in the right upper quadrant. And likely you'll get some type of, um, yeah, you'll, you'll elicit pain with the right upper quadrant, but you'll also likely palpate a, an inflamed uh, gallbladder. And so in that case, with gallstones and cholecystitis, you're likely to get that almost always in the right upper quadrant. Diverticulitis, this is pain that is almost always in the left lower quadrant, in addition to other gastrointestinal symptoms like loss of appetite, nausea, and bloating. All of that would likely be related to diverticulitis or inflammation of the diverticuli that can form in the descending colon. And then finally, pancreatitis. Pancreatitis, this is a little bit more midline, so it's typically right above the umbilicus. So if you were to palpate in the upper quadrants, usually right above the umbilicus, near the curve of the duodenum, you would find a fixed swelling point that does not move during inspiration. That would be a sign of acute pancreatitis. So that's one of the things to look for with pancreatitis it would typically be in the upper quadrants, likely near midline and would not move with inspiration, whereas a hernia would. So I guess that's the difference there is that a, fit, a swelling above the umbilical, above the umbilicus, you're likely, if it's move, move, movable during inspiration, it's likely some type of hernia. If it's not movable, then it's likely to be some type of pancreatitis. So again, diverticulitis, left lower quadrant, cholecystitis or gallstones, typically the right upper quadrant. And then our correct answer here is appendicitis, which is elicited with this, what's called Robsing sign, where you get reproduction of pain in the right lower quadrant with palpation to the left lower quadrant. So kind of this crossed or flipped sign. So there you go. There's your gastrointestinal question for today. Again, I, I do think it's interesting that that the Robsing sign is mentioned specifically on the FSBPT content outline. So I definitely put this, logged, logged this away on a flashcard somewhere so you can remember Robsing sign. That's spelled R-O-V-S-I-N-G, Robsing, Rovsing, however you want to say it. And in any case, uh, so as we, as we proceed on towards the April NPT, so as I record this, it's actually just the day of the January NPTE. So one of the fun myths that exists out there, I, in fact, I just ran into this yesterday. I had a student who is sure that there is a curve to the scoring on the NPTE, meaning that if more people perform poorly, 
that more people will pass or, or a lesser score will be required to pass the test. And that is simply not true. They set the standard or the passing score a lot like a high jump bar. It is predetermined using what's called item response theory. They've tested and retested the items that, pre that are presented to you on test day. And you simply have to exceed the predetermined minimum in order to pass. So it is not only theoretically possible, it is very possible that 100% of students could pass the test on any given test day administration. Now, that being said, the statistics don't bear that out in that not everyone passes on test day because not everyone meets or exceeds that high jump bar. Now, another fun myth, and I've talked about this before, another fun myth that came up just recently as well, was that, uh, did you know that, and this is, this is true, so this part is true, that more people fail the test in July than fail the test in January. And that is absolutely true. More people fail in July than fail in January. So people infer that to mean that the test is harder in July than it is in January. And that's simply not true. Rather, it's that more, more people, so just a gross total, the gross total of people testing in July is greater than in January, and that's due to spring graduation dates. So therefore, the same proportions exist between January and July. It's just that more people are taking it in July, therefore resulting in more, uh, the gross total of people failing the test is greater in July, but not because the test is any different. It's just that there's more people trying to take it in July than in January. So I guess all that to say, the test is the test regardless of when you take it, whether it be January, April, July, or October. And the cool part is that we're here to help you. So one of the things that, that we're getting geared up to start again is that I run a VIP course. So my VIPTs, so as I like to call them, my VIPTs, this is where we go through all the systems on the exam. We meet twice a week and go through practice questions. And it's a great opportunity, not only for you to ask questions, but for me to ask you questions, such as what we're doing in this podcast, where we go through the, not only the why, we talk about what, what precisely is going to be tested. We talk about how it could be tested, the variations, why this is right, why these ones are wrong, how they could be made to be right. The VIP class, my VIPTs, it really is the best bang for your buck. A very robust course in order to get you through all of the systems on test day. What's great about that is that it's a nine-month access. And so once you sign up for the VIP program, you get nine months of access. So that means if you are testing in the summer, you'll get the most bang for your buck signing up early rather than late so that you can participate in more of our live content, take more time to go through all of our recorded content, use all of our six practice exams. I mean, there's just a lot of content to dissect out there. And so it behooves you to sign up earlier than later. Now, you'll st you're still welcome to sign up anytime you want. But the point is, if you want to get the most out of your, your membership to the VIP, the VIPT program, you'll really wanna sign up sooner rather than later. So you can find all that information over at ptfinalexam.com. I also wanted to mention that we are running a free class. It's a free on-campus class that we're running the weekend of Leap Day. So February 29th through March 2nd. You've got to get your registration in before the end of January if you want to participate in that. Again, this is a free live session that we do together. We'll be there all day talking about NPTE content. Plus you'll get the follow-up of full access to our premium course features. And that's where we have a full recorded library of content. Plus uh, we, have, we meet weekly for practice question review. All of that's included totally for free. It's all being sponsored by one of our, our corporate partners, Athletico. Uh, what they wanna do is they want to, to help people as they get ready for and get ready to pass their NPTE. Now, what's cool about this too is not only is the course fee included, but your housing and meals are also included. So you get two nights of housing. So they put you up in a hotel, they give you all your meals and you get access not only to, to our course, but you also get access to uh, Connor Pierce's after the DPT program, which talks about how to pay off your student loans for the least amount possible. Again, it's, it's an unbelievable deal. So if you're anywhere in the Chicago area, you've got to come. It, it's going to be, it'll be a ton of fun. It'll be for the weekend. Again, housing and meals are provided all totally free. I think you'll really enjoy it. The best way to sign up for that is to go to ptfinalexam.com slash podcast, and you can sign up through the enrollment form. Again, spots are extremely limited, so get your application in sooner rather than later if you want to participate in that free weekend. 
All right. So with that, uh, yeah, we'll bring it, go ahead and bring it to a conclusion today. I know that as we go through this process that it's, again, a painful process. I appreciate you sticking with me as we go through these practice questions. Uh, it's a ton of fun on this end to go through content. I know that it's something that like I, I'm currently a practicing PT. I continue to practice. Uh, it's not just something that I, I like to talk about, but this all these principles help me as I treat patients. And so uh, I hope that this will help you not only as you prepare for the exam, but as you carry on into your career, you'll have all these tools at your disposal. You'll become an excellent PT, not only before the end and for the end PT, but afterwards as well. So we'll bring it to a conclusion. Thanks everyone. We'll cram fist pumps all around and I will catch you all in the next episode. Thanks. Thanks.